Welcome to Sisters in Crime Australia and Murder Mondays, when authors talk about their crime craft. I'm Karina Kilmore. I'm a debut crime writer, a journalist, and a national convener for Sisters in Crime. And we've been celebrating women's writing since 1991. Before I introduce Sarah Paretsky, I acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Sarah, Sisters in Crime Australia is thrilled you can join us today. You have helped transform the lives of so many of our members. With your first V.I. Warshawski novel, Double Indemnity, in 1982, which actually was 1984 by the time it got to Australia, you opened up a whole new world of crime writing, a bold, adventurous hero with feminist radical politics, <laughs> such a revelation after the hidebound world of Agatha Christie's England. And then you founded Sisters in Crime at the Bouchacon Crime Festival in 1986. And that inspired us to set up Sisters in Crime Australia 29 years ago. And an interview with you was the feature of our very first newsletter. You also paid us the honour of speaking at our dinner on International Women's Day in 1994. 600 people squeezed into the Paran Town Hall and it still holds the record for our biggest event. A lot has happened during the past three decades with the 20th V.I. Wachowski novel, Just Out. You've published collections of short stories, written other novels and won a stack of awards, including two Anthonys, a Cartier Diamond Dagger, a Gold Dagger, and in 2011, you became a Grand Master of the Mystery Writers of America. Welcome, Sarah. Before we get to the questions, can you please give us your elevator pitch for your latest novel, Deadland? I always feel that my books are like someone who's packed way too many clothes in a suitcase and that there are bits of bra straps and skirts hanging out the sides as she's trying to close it down. So giving an elevator summary for one of my books is, is quite a challenge. But Deadland is set in the world of, it takes my detective V.I. Warshawski into two different landscapes that both have to deal with land use, land misuse, land appropriation, and what happens to people's lives when when land is sold out from under them or harvested out from under them. One set, one piece of land is in Chicago on the south side. It's loosely based on some fights that we've actually been having in the city over turning private, uh, turning public parks over for private use. And the other piece of land is in the middle of, of America in the part of the country where I grew up, Kansas which is a rural state and madly trying to, a few conservationists madly trying to cling to the last little bits of, of prairie that have survived big agribusiness. There's a crime that, that puts legs in both of those pieces of land, but it takes the Warshawski quite a while and quite a few dead bodies before she sorts it out. But she does, our hero does. <laughs> Okay, let's start with our questions. What started you on a life of crime? <laughs> I've been reading crime fiction since I was in my teens, but it wasn't until I was in my early 20s and um, really having my head changed by second wave feminism that I started seeing the ways in which as a detective fiction, especially American noir, pigeonholed women in very, in ways that were really infuriating. Like a woman could be virtuous, but then she was, that meant she was sexually chaste. She couldn't solve problems. She couldn't tie her shoes without adult supervision. Or she would be a vamp, in which case she used her body to try to get good boys to do bad things. And they were inevitably too strong for her. And then on the, the sort of the, so-called cozy side, domestic crime side. If you look at the golden age of, of mystery writing, a woman who in a, a Christie novel or a Dorothy Sayers novel, 
who's been divorced or widowed, she has implicit sexual experience and she may not be a villain, but she's very untrustworthy. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to create a woman who was like me and my friends, just trying to do a job. And in my case, you know, the case of women of my generation, doing jobs that hadn't been available for women when we were growing up. Yeah. Uh, we were part of the first generation to enter the professions and management in large numbers. And we were, we were fighting some pretty um, tough battles to, to be at that bigger table. So I wanted a woman who was taking on that challenge, who had a sex life that had nothing to do with her morality or her, mm. or her ability to solve problems, but it was just part of being human. And she also got to say what was on her mind. She didn't worry about making nice. She didn't worry about being fired. And that was, it, it took me eight years from starting to think about it to actually sitting down and having the courage to, to write about it. But that was, that was where it came from. Fabulous. What's your top writing tip and what's your top self-editing tip? Self-editing tip? My top writing tip, ugh is to sit in the chair and write. Turn off the internet. Do not let the siren sound of the refrigerator call to you. Sit there. I, that is my hardest, um, that is the hardest thing for me. And especially here during the quarantine, it's like, I, I'm lucky I have a house, I have a garden, I have a dog, but I am so effing sick of being in this space. Um, <laughs> And so it's much harder even than usual to sit there. But I think um, it really is, you might have the best, most impressive talent in the world or modest talent, but if you're not sitting there working, it's never going to happen. So that is my top writing tip. Yeah. My self-editing tip, uh, I have a great tendency to rewrite when I'm stuck which is often, uh, almost always for the first half of a novel. And so I'll go back and fiddle and fiddle. And I think, I'm not sure that this really answers the question, but trying to make myself let go of that and say, okay, there will be plenty of time when the book is done to go back and fiddle with everything, get the right sentences, the right sequences, just keep moving forward. So that's, that's kind of my constant push to myself is to sit down work and don't fool yourself in thinking that rewriting the same paragraph 20 times is actually making the book happen <laughs> why is crime so appealing as a genre you know that's such a good question and i i have uh, i have ideas but no no real way of knowing but i think Life is, all, all life is uncertain. It ends, which we hate. Um, we hate the loss of the people we love and care about. We hate contemplating our own loss. And crime fiction is a way of, it's almost like if you do it on the page, it keeps you safe in yourself. So it's not going to happen to you because it's happened on the page. Yeah. Um, I also think that, just because our lives have an arc from beginning to end, crime fiction satisfies that, that narrative arc. We're not left wondering, what on earth was she trying to say there? That's so <laughs> that, that very weighty and philosophical novel that makes no sense to me. Yes, I'm going to put that down and go straight back to Ellie Griffith's new novel and at the beginning, <laughs> a middle and end. And, <laughs> it meets our expectations, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Tell us something not in your book about your main character. Well, there is a good question because, of course, um, I have to keep mining her for, for things that, um, that I don't know and you don't know to, to put in the book so that the books stay fresh. What is there about her that people don't know? Um, I think uh, when I was in my 30s and 40s and, and um, 
trying to decide whether or not to have a child, which I never actually did, I was thinking of vicariously giving VI a child. And so one of the things that never showed up in the books was the debates that, uh, uh, what, would, what would she do if she actually had a baby, if she had my baby, so to speak? Yeah. Oh, that's a sort of terrifying kind of psychological image there. And I thought, okay, well, she'd uh, put it in the backyard with the dogs for the old man that she lives with to, to look after, or she'd get a Harley with a sidecar and then be arrested for child endangerment. Uh, and so it just didn't seem to be the right career move for her. But I don't know if, if that answers the question. It does, it's yeah. It's a debate that, that I went through that um, yeah. ended up not, not That's happening right. for her. yeah. What's the scariest thing in your new novel? In Deadland? Yeah. Um, as opposed to the book that I've started writing and that I've rewritten the same paragraph now 50 times for. <laughs> um, I've gotten to page 65 times since January 1st. Aww. Anyway, in, the, in, the, in Deadland, the scariest thing I think is, um, the amount of surveillance that is easy and possible in today's world. Um, there's, a, there's actually a company called Clearview and I'm a party to a lawsuit trying to get them to cease and desist from using our images without our permission. They go through Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, all those social media sites, probably Zoom right now, and they just collect hundreds of thousands of images of each of us that we're all posting all the time. Then they put them into a database and they sell them to police departments, to governments. Um, your government probably is one of their clients. Mm -hmm. um, the Chicago Police Department is one of their clients. And so this, this surveillance and their ability to pick you out in a crowd with their facial recognition software is to me a sort of a horrific and terrifying thing. And in Deadland, VI, I always call her VI, but VI Warshawski, my detective, um, she is trying to, to set up a situation where she can, can flush the, the bad guys into, into public space and get them dead to rights. But, she yeah. knows that they have the software, the drones, all this capability to follow her and that they have murdered easily and, and without consequences many times. And to me, that's the scariest thing is not knowing when you're safe and where you can go to be safe. Yeah. Yeah, that technology in the book is really quite frightening. What is your writing routine? You said I could skip questions. <laughs> no, yes. I have so many writer writer acquaintances and friends who are, are so disciplined and productive and I'm so not and it just it drives me crazy that I'm not. Um, you know, Sue Grafton of Blessed Memory talked about she would get up at five and write, and I can't remember what her goal for the day was, five pages or something like that. And then she would get that done by sometime like eight. And then she had the rest of the day to herself. No, that is not me. I, I admire it and wish it was me, but that is not me. Um, I do a lot of pawing the earth before I can even get myself sitting down. Um, my husband, who um, died 18 months ago, uh, would work the Sudoku in the morning paper every day, and I was never interested in it, but since his death, I feel compelled to sit down and try to work the Sudoku. So that's, first I walk the dog, then I have my coffee, then I have my breakfast, then I work the Sudoku, and then it's 11 o'clock, and, um, and I get upstairs and, um, and uh, try to make it happen. <laughs> Avoidance is your routine. <laughs> uh, lack of discipline. When I was in high school, we had an algebra teacher named Jack Hennessy, and um, he was always saying, use your brains, don't use brute strength and awkwardness to solve these problems. And I'm thinking, yes, 
Mr. Hennessy, I'm still using brute strength and awkwardness. <laughs> What's the best way to dig yourself out of a bad plot hole? I will see that something isn't working and I will just cut the branch off that tree and go back to the point where it went bad. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it means actually going back to the beginning. I've, I once had to abandon 250 pages and start mm -hmm. over from the beginning. But it's, so, it's happened to me so many times. You know, I think of, of, of people who can think like chess players, like P.D. James said, used to say that she outlined in such a way that she wrote the chapter she was in the mood for that day. And I think of that as being like a, a chess playing thinker, being able to see so many moves ahead. And then there are people like me who are more like tennis players, like the ball is coming, you better make a decision on what you're gonna do with it. Um, and it isn't always the right decision, but because I can't think all those moves ahead until I put the ball in play, I don't know if my idea is actually going to work or not. Okay. With Deadland, uh, I had many different ways that I had been thinking about it. There's a character in Deadland, he's only known as Coop. Mm -hmm. And it, there was never a, a, a place in the novel to explain that his parents were immigrants from Eastern Europe who met in a DP camp and um, they named their children, they learned their English from watching American movies um, and um, their favorite was High Noon with Grace Kelly and uh, Gary Cooper. And so they named their boy Gary Cooper, uh, whatever the last name was, I can't remember now, some unpronounceable Eastern European last name. And the, and the daughter was Grace Kelly and so Coop was just, you know, he was in constant rebellion against that kind of identity. So he's just known as Coop and he never, he never tells you. And there was never a point in the book where, where I could explain that that was his name. But his role and, and how he operated in the book changed many times as I was sorting out the, the plot. Um, I, I originally, there's a, a guy that I know who, um, he's just a restless guy and he, he doesn't sleep much and he walks the parks at night. And I, I only know him as someone who um, I see occasionally with our, when our dogs are at the beach at the same time. That was when the beaches were open and when you could be there with your dog and yeah. all those things. But anyway, um, he knew, he he knew every homeless person in the park. He knew their names, he knew their medical stories and he would stop and talk to them. You'd be walking along and he'd stop and there'd be some amputee with a lot of um, bandages wrapped around her legs and he would just stop and talk to her about where she was and what was going on. And originally that was going to be Coop and there was going to be a, a crime committed in the park and, and one of his homeless ladies. Mm -hmm was going to be the witness. And, you know, I wrote a lot of that and it just, I just couldn't get the story to where it needed to be. So I, I had to abandon it, which made me sad. I still, um, I still miss this scene that I wrote with her on the breakwater at Lake Michigan with Coop finding her in the middle of the night. And what are you doing there in your wheelchair with no one to get you back to the, yeah. Um, sorry, now I've lost track of what the question no, was. No, that's, that's fine. <laughs> we got there. <laughs> Do you start with a plot or a character or something else? I start with the idea of a crime and working out the plot, working out the storyline is, uh, is the hardest part. It only comes to life for me when I have characters who I can set in motion and the and who I engage with. And again, Coop in, in Deadland was, was kind of my main character that, that, that I had that I was trying to, to tell the story with. And then um, as I began thinking about it and moving with it, um, the other main character who makes the story go is a homeless woman 
who had been a significant singer songwriter. Her lover was killed in a mass shooting and uh, the trauma of, of being present for that rendered her mute and um, her life really devolved and disintegrated. And yeah. I, you know, I, I didn't start with the idea of, well, I once was at a house concert with some professional musicians. I was invited to be there. They were just having a kind of a salon and showing off for each other. And these two concert pianists arrived with toy pianos and they played a Brahms piano concerto for four hands on these toy pianos. And it was, I was like, it was just amazing that they could make that kind of music out of these little plunkety plunk toys and so that was kind of where I started with her was um, I had originally imagined her as a concert pianist who, who mental illness had overtaken but then as the story changed she became a singer songwriter and I wrote some of her songs I even looked into hiring someone to write music for them but it, it turned out to be way too complicated and expensive oh. so I abandoned oh, them. that's a lovely beginning for her Oh, it's nice to know that backstory, having just read the book. It's lovely. Mm -hmm. What research, or carrying on from that question, what research did you do for um, your latest novel? Actually, maybe you want to talk about the one you're writing. I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's still too amorphous. But um, I grew up in, in Kansas, which is in the center of the United States. And it's, it's thought of as, as very flat country, but, but in fact, it, it isn't. I mean, one of the things that makes us very, as Kansans, very cranky is all the people from the coast who think of it as flyover country and flatlands and so on. Um, and I don't know why, it may be a function of age that the last couple of, of two of my last three books have sent VI to the part of Kansas that I grew up in, but there are plenty of things I didn't know about the state. And one of them is the, the prairies and the, the effort that ecologists and conservationists are making to, to try to both restore prairie and maintain prairie. And there's some beautiful uh, hilly country. It's a fault line, an earthquake fault line that runs mm -hmm. through the state. And it is flat on the west side of it, but it's an extraordinary, country with canyons and rivers and and these uh, prairie grasses and I didn't know that part of the state and until I was introduced to a photographer who's done a lot of work there and she uh, took me and one of my brothers there guided us on on hikes through those canyons and that's where a big part of the action is is set um, oh wow what a lovely story. discovery yeah, and it was it was really fun doing that research. Some of the research I do is a little more tedious, or sometimes it's one book that I wrote. Um, action takes place in a high in a high rise building under construction, and um, I had a friend whose father was in the heating cooling commercial heating and cooling business, and he got um, the project manager for one of the buildings that he was installing the so the mechanicals in to take me on a tour of the of this the AT&T building that was under construction and they had just poured the deck for the 40th floor the project manager was really pissed that he had to take this stupid bitch around you know um so he took me to the very edge of this unenclosed deck and wait you know you you start fainting or vertigo and he waited for me to turn green and start to fall over the edge and then grabbed me pulled me back and oh and then God. it made me frightened and so yeah. then he was very genial and spent a day with me walking me through the building telling me everything about the details but that was a pretty pretty steep price to pay for for research <laughs> Um, how do you write about violence? Well, that's another good question because um, I'm disturbed, I think, by the way in which a lot of contemporary crime writers are uh, 
have begun taking almost a pornographic pleasure yeah. in in describing acts of violence mm. um, and certainly in describing sexual assault, describing serial killings, all those kinds of things. I um and it, and I I don't want to do that. I think sometimes it's hard. Um, both to be aware of uh, of the reality of of human experience and not to exploit it and titillate with it, and so it's a it's a very fine line to walk. In terms of the scenes of violence in in the books that I write, where there may be physical fights or or the residue of of a physical encounter. I um, subscribe to the Chicago architecture motto that less is more and that um, leaving more to the reader's imagination and less on the page is the best way to do it. Yeah. Yes, I hate that victim voyeurism and that it is, you're right, almost pornographic, some of the descriptions about violence. It's, it's awful. How important is place in your writing? I think um, sometimes people say that Chicago was like a character in the books. I don't, I, it's hard for me to, to parse that, that statement. I think it's more that I write very visually. You know, I see the scene in my mind and so I want to bring it to life for the reader. But the other part of that, especially for Chicago, is I, I came here when I was 19. And it's so hard to believe that that was a long time ago. It feels like yesterday. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I was a volunteer in the civil rights movement and working with a, a children's program. We were doing soft propaganda um, on civil rights. And uh, we took our kids all over the city and they had never been out of their neighborhood, most of them. They lived, lived very parochial lives. And so part of what we were doing was trying to get them to see the whole canvas of a very diverse city. Um, and we'd come back and we'd ask them to tell us what they had seen. And um, the, the first time this happened, you know, I was expecting them to be wowed by the kinds of things that wowed me as coming from small town Kansas, you know, the skyscrapers and the L and all these things. They honed in on the details. They'd seen a drunk on the roof. They'd seen a raccoon walking by the mm. elevated tracks. And it, that was long before I was imagining that I would be you know, I wrote, but in a very modest way, and I never imagined writing books or writing for publication, but it changed me as a writer, um, as someone who was just even writing very privately little things to to keep an eye for for that close-up detail, because that's what brings a scene to life. And a friend of mine um, who was a, a graphic artist, painter, uh, maker of small boxes and sadly, sadly now dead, but she explained to me that in a painting, a landscape painting, you need something that focuses the eye and, you know, maybe you have a butterfly among all of the landscape or just something that, that makes it feel alive and draws you in and that that's similar to what you need to do when you're doing place descriptions in a book. I guess. Oh, that's a great tip. Yeah. How many drafts do you write before handing it in? Well, I lately I've been running to about five drafts and then a lot of rewrites of the final draft. So yeah. I'm a slow, I'm a fast writer when I know what I'm saying, but it takes me a very long time to know what I'm saying. So I'm a slow producer of content, I will say. Right. <laughs> How do you decide the scene of a crime? Good question. Um, and there's so many, one has so many choices, of course. Um, 
some of it has to do with the mood that you're creating and some of it has to do with the structure that you've already set in place. So with Deadland, um, one of the weird things about Deadland and going back to your previous question about place was it's the first book that I've written that's actually set in my neighborhood where I live. It was much harder to write, even though I live in the city, these other areas, you know, the, it it was just bizarre that it was so hard to create fiction about what I see in reality every day. That was, um, so that was, but that structure, setting it in this neighborhood and the University of Chicago, which is an important university research and education institution in the States, it's right in my backyard. That was where my husband uh, was on the physics faculty for many years. Um, and so I had students there and, and people living in the kind of cockroach infested apartments that I lived in when I was a student. And so that determined that some of the crime had to, some of the, uh, the crimes had to be set in those apartments and yeah. some had to be on the streets where my homeless woman was living. Yeah. How much of you is in one of your characters? Well, I would say that in a way, VI speaks in my voice. She says the things that I might not actually say myself, although I find as I get older and my impulse control becomes ever weaker that, um, and then the quarantine, you know, I go out early in the morning to be a scofflaw with my dog, take her to the lake where we're not supposed to be. And yesterday morning, there was this guy who she went and sniffed at his backpack and he got out and just was got out of the water furious. And I found myself just engaged in this, this slanging match with him. It's like, I'm like, Sarah, get a grip. And he's yelling, your dog needs to be on a leash. I said, she is on a leash, which she was. I just wasn't holding the leash. <laughs> and, um, Details. <laughs> and he said, you need to hold the other end of the leash. And I'm like, you need to wear a mask. And, <laughs> um, well, VI would have had something much more sophisticated to say. If she was going to mix up, get mixed up in, a, in an argument with someone, she would say something witty and pithy and cutting, not something just off the top of her angry head. Um, so you're still street brawling. Right. <laughs> um, this is an interesting one, given your um, main character's already been in a movie, but who should play your central character in a new screen production? Well, should that happen, which doesn't seem too likely since Disney's not too interested in letting it happen and they own the rights. But, um, uh. you know, there's a, a series, crime show series here that, it's really kind of goofy, but I love it. Uh, NCIS Los Angeles. And the main woman in it is, uh, she's a Brazilian um, national actually, but, um, and I love kind of her attitude and, and her look and, and the way she handles herself on screen. Uh, Daniela Rua is her name. And okay. I'd, I'd kind of like to see her do VI if, if they would make a TV series about yeah. her. Oh, fabulous. And our last question for uh, this morning is, how would you get away with murder? <laughs> well, I have a little pond in my back garden, and if I killed somebody, maybe I'd just put the body there and let the fish nibble him to death. Ooh. I mean, not <laughs> nibble him to death, but eat the, all the little soft tissue bits. Of course, that might take a while. I'd have to import a piranha, probably. How would I get away with murder? Especially for a long time, our, our basement was a wreck because uh, neighbors' trees, the roots were coming up through the basement floor. And we kept having to try to deal with that. And there was all this dirt showing. Um, now that we've got it all repaired and the trees have come down, then I could have just buried someone under that concrete. <laughs> um, but, You've missed your opportunity now. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Sarah, thank you for being with us um, on Murder Mondays. And if you need a sponsor to come to Australia, you have thousands of our members willing to sponsor you. <laughs> well, thank thank you. you very much. I can't wait to be there to come again. It's been far too long and can't wait for this COVID to be under control so that we can all get together in public again. Yeah, it would be lovely. Well, thank you very much and good luck well, with Deadland. I'm so, uh, Sisters Australia is such a vibrant, dynamic group. I'm just uh, really happy to, to be connected to you. So yeah. thanks a lot. Oh, you're, you were our inspiration, so thank you very much. Yeah. Be well and stay safe. Thank you, Sarah.